Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Megger's Testing Tactics webinar series. Today's topic is understanding different transmission line protection schemes. My name is Michael Fleischer, and I'm the Digital Marketing Specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as a moderator for today's presentation and supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter. On the right side of your screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, your certificate of attendance, copy of the presentation, and link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is Sugo Schuber, Relay Applications Engineer. Also to assist with the question and answer session, we will have joining us Dana Balmani, Applications Engineer, and Abel Gonzalez, Applications Engineer. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today, Sugosh. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. Uh, so today's uh, webinar topic is uh, you know, transmission line protection schemes. Um, here is the agenda for today's webinar. I'll go over the uh, introduction of the transmission lines and you know some of the most commonly used protection schemes to protect transmission lines. And then uh, we will talk about scheme classification. Um, how are these uh, schemes classified, you know, different categories um, and all that. And followed by, uh, we'll talk about uh, an example for a non-pilot scheme. And then we will discuss uh, a variety of pilot schemes. And there are many of them that will be discussed today. And then uh, I will talk about testing. Uh, how can we perform testing of these uh, schemes? And then what kind of test challenges uh, that you may come across, right? And some of the test considerations you need to make uh, when you're testing these schemes, followed by the conclusion. So let's get started. So uh, transmission lines, you know, they are an important section in power system where a you know, transfer of power takes place between the generation and load, right? So they operate at various voltage levels. The transmission lines uh, can be classified, um, you know, based on source to line impedance ratio and also the voltage levels. And so the classification uh, based on SIR, they uh, fall under three more uh, categories, subcategories. It could be like short lines, medium lines, and long lines. Uh, power systems, they operate close to their stability limit. So when we see, uh, you know, some disturbances that occur in power system, they usually occur within a millisecond or less. So what it means is that, you know, the protection system should be able to recognize these faults and clear them as soon as possible. Uh, next, we will look into some of the typical protections that are used for transmission lines. The first one is uh, overcurrent protection. Uh, they are considered to be least expensive kind of protection to be uh, you know, uh, implemented uh, when compared to the other ones. They are mostly used uh, for on the low voltage and medium voltage radial feeders, uh, which means one-way power flow. They are non-selective and they require coordination you know, between other overcurrent devices in the circuit. So there are, they uh, you know, operate efficiently and no nuisance trips occur. Uh, but the thing is in, with overcurrent protection is that uh, they are hard to apply in the mesh networks uh, because of the uh, direction of current can be in any direction on those mesh networks. So for that, uh, we could use the directional overcurrent, you know, which is uh, basically used in mesh networks. And uh, it has a higher, uh, you know, good selectivity. Uh, basically, it's an overcurrent uh, protection with a polarizing source that makes it directional. You know, it's supervised by the direction of the current. So, uh, next uh, type of protection we're going to discuss is the distance protection. Uh, it's uh, also called as impedance protection. Uh, it basically requires both uh, voltage and current information to determine the fault locations. All right. So let's uh, look at this example here. Right. So. Uh, a measuring device is present. You have a source that is feeding this uh, transmission line, and uh, so basically the measuring device, right? And it sees the impedance of the system as a ratio between VL and IL. So under normal conditions, 
that impedance is related to the circulating load. So you can see here the, the impedance, load impedance is PL by I load. But let's say there is a fault that occurs at uh, some point on the line, say here is the fault, uh, then the impedance that is uh, you know, to the fault that is seen by the device becomes the impedance of the line to the point of fault. And you see how the plot changed on the RX uh, plane here. This is the you know, fault impedance. Uh, distance protection you, know, you can have a phase on and ground uh, distance protection implemented. Uh, it has a you know, good sensitivity and, um, and in the sense that it handles load encroachment. It requires coordination, uh, just like we spoke about in overcurrent, because there are multiple zones that are that are created um, for distance protection. Uh, next type of uh, protection that we are going to talk about is uh, communication assisted trip schemes. So, uh, and the majority of the focus on today's webinar would be on the communication assisted trip schemes. So, as the name suggests, there is a communication channel that is involved, which means that, you know, there is more than one relay involved in the, in the scheme. There are multiple, there can be two relays in the scheme, there can be multiple relays in the scheme. So, um, so and and they are considered as a fast tripping schemes you know, uh, as opposed to the conventional distance or any other protection that we just discussed in the previous slides uh, next next up we will talk about a non-pilot scheme uh, uh, before we go non-pilot uh, we'll talk about the scheme classification so the schemes are uh, first and foremost classified under under two categories. And the first one is the pilot-based scheme, and then non-pilot-based scheme. So pilot pilot protection, uh, you know, we talked about communication-assisted trip schemes. So those come under the pilot schemes. Uh, pilot protection is you know used for high-speed tripping, and in this type of protection, the quantities at different terminals are compared using uh, some kind of communication channel instead of a direct wire interconnection. So that is what pilot schemes are. And then an uh, example of non-pilot scheme would be a distance protection, like a step distance protection. You don't have uh, communication involved. There are, you know, there are multiple zones that uh, of settings that are present in the step distance relay that is monitoring uh, the line for faults on, on any, anywhere on the line. So, uh, uh, then the pilot schemes are then classified into current based and the direction comparison based. So under current uh, classification, it's then further classified into phase comparison and charge comparison and current differential. Right. Uh, under direction comparison, we have it classified into permissive type and blocking type schemes. So uh, in these schemes, basically the relays exchange information on each ends to uh, ensure presence of fault at the expected location on the line right, before before the fault is clear. So that is how the schemes, uh, the basic principle on these schemes are. And uh, you know, the permissive and blocking differ uh, in the fact that uh, the scheme requires a permissive signal you know, between the relays to be exchanged uh, so that it can issue a trip for a fault. Whereas for the blocking, it's the opposite, it requires to the relays to see a blocking signal so that the, uh, they don't trip on a fault which is not on the line. So uh, some of the commonly known uh, trip schemes um, are you know, the POTT, uh, POTT and UTT under permissive. And then we also have DCB and DCUB schemes. So uh, so today's uh, webinar will, will majority focus on, on these schemes here. Uh, under permissive and blocking. So the uh, the current based schemes uh, will be uh, you know discussed in detail in an upcoming webinar in the month of August later this year. Uh, next, we will talk about uh, the non-pilot scheme, uh, which is the step distance protection. Uh, so step distance protection is one of the common methods employed in distance relays. Uh, for transmission line protection. So here, uh, you know, the method makes use of the impedance of the line to create multiple zones of protection. And each zone is calculated by a predetermined percentage of the line impedance. Okay, 
So uh, basically the settings uh, with respect to each zone in a relay will define uh, the relay impedance characteristic. So there's something, like, uh, there are certain characteristics that are called as more characteristic and quadrilateral characteristic, and there are many others. These are the common ones that are used and they are displayed on an RX plane, right? So here is an example of a Mo characteristic. So let's say uh, uh, here's my transmission line where, where here's a Mo circle on the RX plane. And this Mo circle uh, is set for a particular reach setting, which it relates to a part of the impedance on the line. So basically this Mo circle is protecting part of a transmission line. And, uh, and let's say when the relay, here's the relay location, and when the relay, uh, the, fault, uh, the impedance, fault impedance that the relay is measuring, if that falls within the small circle, it means that it has detected a fault and it's going to trip for the fault. So anywhere inside the MO is the operate region. External to the MO, the calculation of the uh, impedance would be on the restraint region, so no trip external. Okay? And here is an example of the uh, of an uh, quadrilateral characteristic, uh, similar to the MO. Uh, you have uh, operating restraint regions, and here is your relay location. It's just the uh, way this uh, characteristic is defined and built. And then uh, we'll talk about typical zone settings. What what are some of the zone settings that you would come across on these relays? Uh, so it so in this uh, particular uh, diagram, what I show here is three zones of uh, protection. I have transmission line a, a to B, and then a line from B to C, right? So zone one protects 80% of line AB. That is how, uh, you know, this is a typical setting. It can be 75%, it can be 90%. Uh, I'm just showing these settings as an example. And then zone two is 120% of that line. So it reaches beyond line AB, it goes to BC here. And then zone three can be 150%. You know, you, all, you would also have seen that zone three usually is a reverse uh, direction uh, zone that is set in the reverse direction of the transmission line. So uh, next, let us uh, look uh, into an example of what happens. Uh, how does the distance, uh, step distance uh, work when there is a fault on the line? Right? So here, here I show again the transmission lines A to B and B to C, two of them. And then we have zone one, uh, that shows it's covering 80% of the line and it is an instantaneous function. There is no time delay. Then um, zone two covers 120% uh, of the line, right? Or, you know, it goes beyond the line. And with it, with a time delay of 0.5 seconds that is set for zone two. And then zone three uh, goes to 150% on the line, well, beyond the line. And then it has a delay of 0.85. Second. So, uh, so when there is a fault that is as shown on line AB, which is close to the breaker A, uh, so zone one, uh, zone one is the closest that is uh, to the fault that is it's looking at the fault. Zone two and three will also be detecting the fault, but ideally we want zone one to trip for this fault, and it's an instantaneous function, so it is going to trip uh, for that particular fault, right? So if the fault lies at this point on line AB, so zone one would not be seeing this fault now since it lies outside zone one's reach, right? It's only zone two and zone three which will be looking at this fault. But uh, because of the time differences, the time delay differences between zone two and zone three, uh, zone two is going to um, take care of this fault before zone three would. Right? So there's a fight between the two. And uh, in the last example here, in this location on line BC for the uh, fault, the zone three is the only one that is going to see in this case, and it will going to uh, trip for that fault after that time delay. But, uh, uh, next, we will talk about uh, pilot schemes. Before we go into the schemes, uh, itself we are going to talk uh, about the channel classification you know different types of communication channels are used in pilot protection schemes the first one uh, you know talk about is pilot wires they are uh, basically you know twisted uh, wire pairs that are used for transmitting uh, you know a 60 hertz or a 50 hertz uh, signal between different terminals 
uh, next type of uh, communication is a uh, power line carrier, right? I have a picture that uh, would help you uh, visualize it much better. So basically the radio frequencies are you know, transmitted over high, vo high voltage line here, uh, and they are in the range of uh, 30 and 300 kilohertz. Right? The way this works is that uh, you know, you know, uh, the RF uh, signal is connected to the uh, line here, the high voltage line, uh, through a tuner and a coupling capacitor unit. So the tuner cancels the capacitance of the uh, coupling unit. So what this does is it ensures uh, a low impedance resistive path for the, uh, you know, the RF signals to be efficiently transferred. And we have the, the setup, similar setup on the other end as well. So, uh, so that you know, the, the RF passes through to the receiver on the other end. Uh, a line trap is also connected in the line here at each terminal to minimize the signal loss. So, so that is how a uh, power line carrier channel communication channel works. The next one is the audio frequency tones that are used with these type of channels we just discussed, uh, you know, be it power line carrier, or these uh, wire pairs, and they are uh, uh, in the range of 1000 to 3000 hertz. The fourth type of uh, channel is uh, known as microwave. And again, you have uh, radio signals that are transmitted between the terminals uh, here, basically by the line of sight. And they range between two and 12 gigahertz. So uh, when I say it's by line of sight, it means that uh, the medium in this case is basically space. Right? So no additional equipment is needed. And it's important to account for uh, topology of the transmission path, which can affect the signal. And the last one is uh, digital channel. Uh, an example would be, you know, an optical fiber or multiplex networks. So next, let's uh, uh, delve into the pilot schemes. The first one under the pilot scheme is uh, direct underreaching transfer trip scheme. Um, so direct means that uh, there is no uh, you know, two-way communication uh, at the same time here, which means only one relay will send a signal to the second relay depending on the location of the fault. That's what direct term stands for. Underreaching uh, means that uh, zone one protection comes into picture, right? uh, which means that the relays that are set up on each end of this transmission line are looking for underreaching um, condition that needs to be satisfied and then transfer trip means that uh, you know there is a signal that is exchanged i mean there's a signal that is sent from one relay to another for the tripping purpose so uh here is the setup that's shown uh, the relay and breakers on each end like i said and here is the communication uh between the two uh two protection devices right so let us see what happens when there's a fault on the line at this particular point on the line, right? So when there's a fault at this location on the line, the relay one is going to see this fault in the zone one, right? So it's seeing an under under each condition already. So the relay is going to, uh, you know, where the signal is going to be sent into the R gate in the logic. And then the R gate is going to send a trip signal to the breaker, right? So to trip the breaker. But at the same time, right, uh, the relay two and the remote relay also is seeing that fault. So uh, what happens next is that uh, after the trip, uh, circuit breaker trips from the relay one here, uh, there's a signal uh, that is sent from the trans uh, transmitter of the relay one to receiver on relay two, right? This is uh, a signal that is sent to relay two to trip for that fault that it's looking at, right? So when relay two sees this uh, this command, it is going to uh, you know get the signal on its logic. Since it's R gate, it just needs either under reaching condition or a command signal from the opposite end for it to be able to trip the breaker. So uh, in this case, the time taken for for the relay two to trip for the fault, this fault was uh, you know still outside its under reach, but it still tripped. Uh, based on the command from the relay one, uh, the time taken uh, to trip off a relay two may be somewhere close to uh, three cycles or a very few cycles. Uh, if this was a conventional distance scheme, 
the relay two would have say uh, you know would have seen like a zone two fault and would have cleared um, after uh, you know the a delay maybe of 25 cycles or you know whatever delay the conventional distance uh, zone two would have. So we did see how quick the DOTT scheme isolates the fault as compared to the conventional distance scheme. Um, so let quick summary on the DOTT uh, scheme. So we see we see that you know it operates at very high speed for uh, you know closing faults and so on one faults, uh, which means it's faster than a conventional distance scheme, right? And then uh, you know overlapping underreaching zones. So the underreaching functions you see here on the relay one, you see the underreaching function goes all the way up to this point on the line. Same way the underreaching function goes up to this point on the line. They must overlap. If they don't overlap, there would be a dead zone on the line where no faults would be detected. Uh, since the communication channels are involved, if there the there are noisy channels, there can be a false trip. Uh, so the the scheme does not operate for faults that is beyond the reach of the uh, you know underreaching elements. If the remote circuit breaker is open, or if the remote communication channel is inoperative, so uh, for this reason, you know, DOTT schemes are often used as uh, only a supplement to other pilot tripping schemes. Uh, next type of uh, scheme we'll talk about is permissive underreaching transfer trip (PUTT). Uh, so, permissive term uh, means that a permissive trip signal will be sent from one relay to another, and then both relays must agree with each other and also detect the fault in the right direction. Right? Permissive signal is exchanged. And then underreaching means the scheme is still looking for a zone one fault, you know, it's underreaching uh, scheme. And then transfer trip is, uh, you know, the predictive device is sending a signal to another predictive device uh, to trip. Right? So uh, again, here is a setup of the relays with circuit breakers on each end on the line. And then uh, here's a communication on both sides that is shown along with the logic inside the relay. So uh, when there is a fault on the line that is closer to breaker one, like you see there, relay one will see a zone one fault. So in the logic, a zone one fault, uh, zone one signal is activated and goes to the R gate here. Right. Uh, so the first relay will trip immediately because it sees its own one fault. There's no time delay. But at the same time, it's going to send the same zone one signal. Uh, it's going to send a permissive. It keys in a permissive signal through the transmitter on relay one to the receiver on relay two. And uh, and and so once the relay two receives this permissive signal from one. The relay two is also looking at the fault, but it is a zone two fault, right? So the zone two signal activates in the relay and the AND gate is activated, which then activates your OR gate in the, in the relay. And then it, it sends a signal to the breaker to trip the breaker, right? So the trip here is supervised uh, by a zone two detection, right? So the time taken again, for this, these trips are, are very minimal, maybe a few cycles, uh, very faster than a conventional distance. A quick summary on the on the POTT scheme. Uh, this scheme is you know similar to the DOTT. They both are still looking at the uh, uh, underreach functions to start with, but then except that you know the each terminal is uh, the tripping is supervised by a uh, over RO, RO function like overreach as well and since and it's using a permissive trip signal right so uh, the thing with uh, comparison with PUTT and DUTT is that uh, PUTT has very less chances of maloperation under noisy channel conditions as compared to DUTT because there is a, a you know supervision of fault uh, zone 2 fault Right after receiving a permissive signal, unlike DUTT, there is no supervision on that. The moment uh, the relay two received the fault, it just tripped on it. So, um, and then 
for the out of section faults, uh, you can say PUTT does not send a permissive, right? If the if the fault lies on, out of this section here, the, uh, this particular relay will see over a uh, uh, fault, but then it won't send a signal um, to the opposite relay here, right? So a PUTT scheme is ineffective for faults beyond the unreached function uh, near the open terminal when the when the remote breaker is open. So uh, next uh, type of scheme we're going to talk about is uh, POTT scheme. Uh, you know, the only difference between the POTT and PUTT is the, you know, between the overreach and underreach. So basically here, the relays that are on each end are looking for an overreach condition, right? So you see that uh, the overreach on relay one is all the way up to, let's say, 120% of the line. And for the relay two, the overreach you see here is on the other direction, 120 person. Um, so uh, the basic logic for a POTT scheme is that it requires zone two elements. And according to this logic, it requires a permission received from the remote end. So basically it has to satisfy these two conditions for to be able to trip, right? So when we have fault on this line at this location, uh, it both the relays will see a uh, overreach condition because this fault falls on the overreach on both the uh, relay settings. And then it sends the permissive, right? Both the relays receive the signals from each end and then the AND gate is activated, right? Because the AND gate requires the permission from the other end as well as the relay to send a signal that it has seen as zone to fault, right? Once this condition satisfied, uh, the relays are going to trip the circuit breakers and isolate the part from the system. A uh, quick uh, uh, summary on the POTT uh, is that for external faults, the overreaching uh, at only one end of the line operates, right? So uh, if there's an external fault here, uh, so the overreach condition is still seen here, but since the other relay is not going to see a fault, since the fault is behind the uh, relay, there won't be any permissive received. So what happens is the tripping is not initiated at the, in that case. The, so you can say that the scheme is very secure, that it does not trip for any external fault if the communication channel is inoperative. Okay. Um, but the scheme, you can say, lacks dependability because it does not trip the line for an internal fault if the channel is uh, inoperative, right? the communication channel. So uh, in those cases, you know, you would have uh, the conventional distance element as a, a backup protection. And then like we saw, these elements would trip for overage condition on zone two. Okay. And then you would have uh, special conditions where you can have a system with parallel lines and you would see current reversal direction. So in that case, you would require additional supervision for the existing POTT to be able to tackle the current reversal condition. Uh, next type of uh, scheme we'll discuss would be classified under the blocking uh, type of scheme. And this is known as DCB, which is a directional comparison blocking. So unlike previously discussed schemes, uh, this uh, scheme uses a blocking uh, signal to ensure that relays don't trip on an external fault. So what uh, I show here is that, you know, the transmission line A to B, and then we have a transmission line B to C, and we have faults that are shown on multiple locations of these lines, right? Along with that, uh, we also have uh, zones. Uh, what are the zones that cover, uh, you know, uh, different uh, you know, parts of these lines? Like, for example, like zone A, uh, zone one, you know, from relay A's perspective, this is the coverage for zone one on the line A to B. And zone one for relay B would be on this direction here. Uh, I just marked up these zones so it's easier for you to visualize where these zones actually uh, cover, right? And then zone two on relay A covers all the way up to this point. You see these arrows there because it's zone two for relay A, and zone two for relay B is in the other direction. And then zone three for relay A is in the uh, reverse direction, uh, and similarly, zone three for relay B is also in the reverse direction for that particular relay. 
So in this uh, example, let us take a look at the fault tree right, and see what happens, uh, how the scheme works. So for this particular fault F3, uh, relay A is uh, going to see this fault as a zone two forward fault, right? This, uh, since this fault uh, falls under the zone two coverage of relay A, it's going to see a zone two forward fault. It's in the forward direction. Uh, but the relay B also sees this fault but it is seeing it in the reverse direction. It's a zone three reverse fault. That's how this sees this fault as, right? So ideally you would uh, want, you would want the relays on this line to take care of the fault and you know, don't want the uh, relay A uh, to trip for a fault that's external to the line, right? That is the ideal scenario. So let's see how this can be achieved. Uh, so what happens is, once the B uh, relay sees a zone three reverse fault, it's going to send a key in a blocking signal to the relay A, right? And once relay A receives a blocking signal from B, uh, but it also sees a zone two forward, in the relay A's logic here, the trip signal would be blocked because there's a knot here uh, for the block signal, right? So anytime relay sees a block and it sees a zone two forward, it will not be uh, allowed to trip because it received a block from B. Uh, so in this case, relay A will not trip for the fault, but relay B, uh, you know, B relays on this particular line will trip for this fault. So that is how uh, DCB scheme works. Uh, and a quick summary on the DCB is that uh, we saw it uses a blocking signal to ensure correct operation depending on the direction of the fault and the you know, uh, element that it compares to detect the fault. So uh, so basically for uh, in section fault, uh, there will be no blocking signal sent from B or A, right? So because it's inside the section, no blocking signal is sent. So both uh, the end, both ends will trip fast. But for out of section fault, like we saw in the previous slide, uh, there will be a blocking signal uh, at the transmitter at the nearest end, right? The, this is the nearest end to the fault, so that the trip on the opposite end can be blocked. Right? And a coordination between the relay zone elements is uh, very important. So in the sense that you know, here in this example, the zone three element must reach further on the line as compared to the zone two element, right? If it's the other way around, then zone zone three would not be detecting the fault, but zone two on the opposite end would be detecting the fault. So coordination is crucial. Um, another type of a blocking scheme is uh, known, called as the directional comparison unblocking, uh, DCUB. Uh, and it's uh, similar to POTT, uh, but with few additions here. So in the normal system conditions, you see here we have the, the setup here. Uh, you have this communication that is set up in the normal system conditions. Uh, you would see that there is a guard a signal that's being continuously uh, sent on both the ends to each other. Uh, the guard signal is nothing but a block signal. And uh, so when there is a fault on the line, let's say there's a fault condition, uh, the blocking signal is not exchanged anymore. The, uh, the blocking signal is stopped. And then since the relays are looking at the uh, overreach, overreaching condition, uh, they're going to send, uh, send in the signals to each other, right? And then trip the breaker. So this is uh, during the fault condition, but it has a check, uh, but there is always a guard signal, um, you know, until it, the relays detect the fault. So now um, let's uh, navigate back to a normal condition where the guard is continuously uh, being exchanged, the guard signal. Uh, when there's a fault again, but uh, this time there is a, you know, there can be a failure in the communication channel. Let's say uh, the transmitter trip signal is short circuited by the fault, right? When that happens, uh, you know, a timer is started, right? There's a timer that starts and these timers are, you know, are typically set around 100 to 150 milliseconds. So um, scheme allows the trip to uh, take place, you know, if that is within the window of this timer, right? So the scheme allows the trip of the breakers. But once the timer is expired, and if the fault is not detected by, uh, you know, by these relays, the scheme will allow tripping only if the trip signal is received, 
right? So the assisted trip uh, will not be uh, supported if the timer is expired and the fault was not detected by this relay. Uh, a quick summary on the DCUB. Uh, in principle, it is similar to POTD scheme, except that it, you know, um, you know, it requires the relays to detect an overreach condition on the receipt of a trip signal sent from the remote relay. Uh, except that you know it uses a continuous guard signal for extra security, right? And uh, and this uh, scheme, it, it, tripping on external faults occurs only if the you know fault uh, you know that occurs within the time interval of the channel failure. We spoke about the timer, so you could say the scheme has a dependability of a blocking scheme and the security of a, a permissive scheme. Let's uh, do a quick comparison of uh, permissive and blocking schemes now that we have uh, gone through all these different schemes. A permissive scheme, uh, you can say, ha uh, has decreased dependability because the protection will not trip fast if there's a failure in the communication medium, right? So we saw uh, how that happens. But uh, in the blocking scheme, it is, uh, you can say, it's dependable because uh, even when there is a failure in the communication, the protection will uh, trip anyway. Right. And talking about security, you know, permissive schemes are sec uh, more secure compared to the blocking because when the communication uh, fails, the protection will not trip high speed. Right. Uh, on the contrary, the blocking schemes are less secure because uh, the failure of the you know the carrier of the communication will cause the protection to trip and for an out of section call. So these are some things you know to keep in mind when you're uh, dealing with different type of these schemes. Next, uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about you know, testing. Uh, how you could perform testing of these schemes. Basically, you would be uh, using end-to-end -end testing. So, end-to-end -end testing is evaluation of a relay protection scheme by simulating fault conditions simultaneously at each end of the transmission line. So, uh, this typically includes you know all protective relays, uh, you know interface equipments like you know the carrier or aux relays, and any communication. Uh, equipments or fat, you know, like power line carrier, and fiber optics, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this type of testing basically allows the entire relay scheme to be tested uh, uh, as a whole, and uh, as opposed to like you know individual components. So you have different components in the whole scheme. So end-to-end -end testing validates the whole scheme, right? and uh, and and not just the double-ended schemes, but uh, you know, where you have multiple terminals, more than two terminals, end-to-end -end testing tends to be used to validate those type of schemes. So, uh, one of the important factors in end-to-end -end testing is uh, considered is the synchronization. So, the most challenging task is to provide the test quantities at all the line terminals uh, simultaneously. Is remember we are dealing with um, communication-based uh, protection schemes, which means injection of the test values on on each end in a synchronized manner is very important. So to be able to synchronize the you know the test systems, we need the time sources. So it's like a reference signal that is used to synchronize the test uh, test systems. Right? And we will discuss more about synchronization and time sources in the uh, uh, further slides. So why do we do end-to-end -end testing is, you know, uh, because the, these protection schemes, like we discussed today, uh, starting from overcurrent and directional, conventional distance, and all the way to the pilot schemes have advanced so much over the years. Uh, so, you know, the testing techniques had to change accordingly as well. So evolution uh, of these test methods have uh, it is used something like end-to-end -end testing. And this is the only way you can validate a communication-based scheme uh, in its entirety uh, successfully. And, and using end-to-end -end testing, you can locate uh, many issues, uh, if there are any you know, present uh, with the scheme. There, can, there could be incorrect wiring between individual components. Uh, you could have uh, uh, coordination issues or time, timing issues, you know, incorrect settings or you know, uh, faults or sympathetic uh, tripping problems you could face, or even issues with communication equipment. So all these can be located by performing end-to-end -end testing. Okay. Uh, we did discuss that we perform end-to-end -to, -end to co validate communication-based protection schemes. And what do we want to test with those schemes, right? Different scenarios. Basically, you would want to simulate an internal fault or it can be an external fault to the zone of protection. 
uh, to validate the scheme. And when do you need to perform this testing? Can be performed during new installation. Uh, you know, it's an opportunity for realistic simulations, uh, wherein the schemes can be validated before putting them in the system for uh, for use. Right? Can be performed during maintenance testing. Uh, where you can, you know, even the breakers can also be involved in the scheme, so you could see the breaker operation that is verified with respect to the scheme. Right? Uh, you could be performing a troubleshooting. You would need to perform end-to-end -end if you're troubleshooting a scheme. Uh, let's say there was a setting change or a modification or a design change in scheme. You would still want to perform end-to-end -to, -end to be able to validate uh, the scheme. So here is a it's a big picture of end-to-end -end, uh, testing. So what we have here is a transmission line that is shown, uh, wherein we have a circuit breaker and a relay on, on the each end of the transmission line in the substation. And uh, there's a communication uh, channel between these relays here. So for the test setup, you have a test equipment that is connected to the relay A on one side, and then you have a GPS receiver. Remember, we spoke about uh, time sources that is required to synchronize test systems. So we have a GPS receiver here that is uh, providing your time signals to the relay test sets. And also you would have a GPS uh, time signal onto the relay. So even your uh, relays are uh, synchronized as well. Uh, the same setup is present on the other side as well. And the GPS receivers receive the uh, uh, GPS uh, signals from the uh, satellite. So uh, the GPS signal, sometimes you would just have a GPS signal readily available, uh, the units in the substation. You don't have to exclusively set them up, but let's say if you don't have any available, then you would need a additional GPS unit to be able to get the time signals. So uh, different types of tests are as follows. One of them is a non-synchronous test. If like you see in the screen, uh, here is uh, you know, one of the schemes as an example, and we have the test set on only on the one end of the scheme, right? Uh, this is called a single-ended test. Uh, sometimes you, you don't really need two, uh, uh, two test equipments for to perform this non-synchronous test, and you also don't need GPS source you know, to perform a test like on a scheme like DTT or a DUTT. Uh, next type of uh, test is a synchronous test, which is nothing but uh, the end-to-end -end testing, where you have uh, equipments on both ends of the uh, setup. It's called a synchronous test. Uh, there are different test methods under synchronous test. One of them is a states playback, where where you create multiple states that simulates uh, different uh, you know, situations uh, uh, during the power systems, right? So conditions in the power system. So one of them, let's say, for example, is pre-fault state. You know, you have normal load conditions that is uh, on the power in the power systems. So you uh, simulate that state here, or, and uh, followed by which you would uh, simulate a fault state on that particular line. And uh, based on the scheme, and however it behaves for the fault, you would have a third state, which is a post-fault, what happens after the fault. So you know, as an example, in the pre-fault state, you, know, you would have the currents and voltages, uh, you know, which would mimic like a pre-fault condition, like a nominal load condition. And in the fault state, you would have, uh, you know, the currents and voltages which would mimic, let's say, a reach, uh, a reach setting, which it goes beyond the reach setting on the relay, uh, or which matches a reach setting on the relay, uh, that mimicking a particular zone of uh, uh, fault. And then you have the post fault. So you just have the voltage present and no currents after the trip, right? So uh, just wanted to show these, uh, you know, different tables here of currents and voltages just to show uh, how you would set up different uh, states for the states playback. A second type of test method is the COMTRADE or the DFR playback. Uh, COMTRADE basically stands for Common Format for Transient Data Exchange for Power Systems. So COMTRADE uh, basically, you know, file is something that stores the oscillography and data that's related to power system disturbances. So, uh, you know, the COMTRADE files, you can uh, get it from the relay. The relay stores all the events, right, from the event recorder. And the same uh, data can be played back onto the relay using a test equipment. And that is what the DFR playback method is. 
And these contract files can be produced by um, fault simulation softwares as well, wherein you create your own power system, right? And you model the power system, you uh, simulate certain faults, and you can download contract files from them as well. Uh, next, we'll talk about uh, GPS uh, receiver units and different timing modes, right? So the GPS system consists of uh, 24 operational satellites and at least uh, four satellites are in view at all times from all places on the earth the gps receiver it uh, you know it uh, tracks all the available satellites uh, simultaneously and then uh, you know it provides you information like the time the date the position and altitude right and so those are accurate time signals and uh, there are different uh, types of timing mode like how you could use uh, these signals Right, one of them is a static timing mode. So this type of mode is used when the user uh, has the information on the position and altitude, and you know the the test setup is stationary, and you the user uh, knows uh, the particular location. And this is uh, you know it's been used for end-to-end -end testing. Uh, multiple satellites are used to derive the timing information, but only one satellite needs to be tracked in this type of uh, mode, right? But in the dynamic timing mode, uh, this mode is used when the user does not have the information on the, you know, the position and altitude. And then uh, in here, the GPS unit that is connected to the test equipment, it, uh, it actually continuously computes the position that from the signal it, you know, it uh, receives and derives the timing information from multiple satellites on in dynamic timing mode. Next, uh, we will talk about the different time signals. Uh, that can be obtained from GPS receiver, right? and also there are, uh, you know, like IRIC B is one of type of uh, time signal, and POP is another type of time signal that you can receive from the GPS receiver. Uh, there are other types of time signals that can be used as well that are known as, you know, the precision time protocols and network time protocols and different protocols available out there. But uh, here today I'll be talking about the uh, IRIC B and uh, POP. They are most commonly used as of this point. Um, so IRIC B is, you know, most commonly used uh, time signal, and it's a standard serial time code. Uh, it's basically you know, serial data stream that repeats once per second, and there are different uh, signals again, type of signals which are unmodulated and modulated signals. So depending on what kind of uh, format the relays that you that you use expect to receive these signals, you would have to uh, use those signals. Uh, you know. Typically, unmodulated signals are used uh, unless uh, you know you need you have a need for modulated signals. The next uh, type is the POP, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, it is basically uh, referred to as a programmable pulse output, and these uh, signals are you know precisely timed pulses, basically, uh, and they are programmed within a resolution of 100 nanoseconds. Uh, the polarity and the pulse width of the signal can be selected by you know by the user uh, depending on your test or specifications and you could uh, use this signal in one of these two ways one is a one shot mode and uh, second one is a repeat shot mode in the one shot mode uh, only a single pulse is generated at the specified time and date you know by the user and uh, in the repeat shot mode you still mention the time and date like we do in the one shot mode but then you also have something called as repeat interval. So after the initial pulse is generated, the subsequent pulses will occur at this uh, repeat interval that was specified by the user. So that, that is uh, how these signals could be used. Now, uh, what are the steps we need to take when we are performing the testing, right? So it depends on where you're testing, if it's a lab environment or if you're working in the substation, you would want to isolate uh, the system that is under test, right, from rest of the system, so you're not uh, sending back the signals into the system. So uh, uh, we would have to connect the test equipment, right? And uh, like I said earlier, if you don't have the GP, uh, time source um, signals available for your relay, you would have to uh, have the GPS antenna installed and uh, to get the time reference signals. The first thing. Uh, important thing to uh, do is perform a meter test. Right? Basically, you would inject currents and voltages on each end to ensure the magnitude and phase angles are being metered correctly on the relays. 
this will uh, tell you that you know your wiring connections are are correct. And and following which, you would uh, make sure that uh, you, know, you have the right test cases for the test method you are you are using. You know, be it a you know TFR playback or a states sequencer uh, method, states playback method. Uh, and what kind of test cases you have created, you know, what kind of faults you're going to simulate. So you would have to have all those handy when you're ready for test. Uh, so here's an example of uh, you know, how a test table would look like. Uh, uh, so I have the transmission uh, lines A to B and B to C shown here, and I have uh, multiple faults right, that are shown here that you know we would want to simulate. One fault is uh, close to relay A or the breaker A, and second fault is close to B, and the third fault is on the line B and C. So this is just an example table. You know, uh, reporting methods would uh, differ between companies and, and and your preferences basically. But this is just an example that shows how a test case would look like for a simulation example of F1. Right. So here I uh, I'm, I'm considering the states playback. Let's say I have uh, three states, pre for fault and post fault. And here would be the values for the voltages and currents for relay one and relay two, right? So we would uh, have that information in these three states. And based on how the scheme behaves and trips, you would have the trip times for the relay one and relay two, right? So this is how a typical uh, test table looks like. Uh, next, uh, we will talk about uh, the test challenges, right? What are some of the test challenges we would come across? So one of them, uh, important. Uh, one is uh, you know the time delay between two test equipments right because you're using two test equipments on each ends and we are talking about synchronization uh, both the test sets uh, need to inject at the same time right uh, if they are of different models or you know, different vendors so test equipments are basically you know like computers they take time to process signals uh, even though that uh, time taken to process is very small, uh, it you know it still matters because we're talking about protection. Right? So, um, so how would we find out uh, the delay between the two test equipments is uh, having this uh, simple setup where you have a digital recorder or an oscillograph basically, where you have the connections from the test equipments made, you know, for voltage and current injection, and you also have the GPS uh, or the time sources. Right, that is uh, providing you a trigger pulse or the trigger signal for both the test sets to start injection. So what you would do is uh, once uh, you, would, you would turn on this recorder first and as soon as the trigger pulses are received with these test sets, uh, the test sets would start injecting the voltages and currents. Right? Once, once that happened, uh, this is what you would be expecting to see on the oscillograph you have a synchronized trigger pulse. In this example, it's a POP, right, uh, pulse. And then based on this pulse as a reference, you would look into the time where the first test equipment started the injection. So the delay time for the first uh, test equipment is, is A here. And similarly for the second test equipment is B, right? So there's a difference between when these test equipments are starting to inject these values, which uh, will not help our cause because for end-to-end -end we need synchronized uh, injection. So we have a, a difference of these, uh, difference of time between these two, which is known as the compensation time. Well, the reason we call this compensation time is we need to compensate for this time, right? So uh, here is an uh, example table uh, where we uh, compare you know, a particular couple of models of uh, test equipment, where model A processing time is 23.7 milliseconds. And then model B has a processing time of uh, 380 microseconds. So you see there's a lot of difference between these two. So which means that model B is the uh, faster test set. And which also means that this particular test equipment needs to be delayed by the delay time. We spoke about the compensation time so that both of uh, relay A and B are uh, you know, synchronized and they perform synchronized injection. Of course, when you use the same kind of test equipment on both, uh, both, both ends, you don't have to delay any of those because they, they should be injecting at pretty much the same time. And uh, once you have uh, the delay time, uh, you would you know use it either on the uh, on the time time unit to uh, to mention you know which time unit you're using, uh, uh, and then or you could also use it on the software itself, the test software that you use to perform the testing. 
and on that particular test equipment. Uh, next, we'll talk about uh, uh, the consideration and challenges that we come across uh, you know, performing into end testing. So one of them is the breaker simulator. You could consider using uh, uh, the output from the test equipment to simulate a breaker instead of uh, you know, having the real breaker being tested many times. Of course, it goes both ways. Uh, if you have the option of you know, uh, testing the breaker, you could do that. If you don't have the option, uh, and you're performing a test in a lab environment, you're, you're making sure the relays operate fine, you can still use a breaker simulator. Um, and then uh, what are some of the uh, additional checks you would perform and what kind of selection you would make for your fault simulations? Right? So like we discussed earlier, you would, uh, you would want to simulate multiple types of faults, like say 5% on the line and 50% on the line or 95% on the line. So at different, uh, locations on the line, you are simulating the fault to make sure the schemes operate as they're supposed to, right? And, 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 again, and you would uh, want to, you know, um, simulate different types of faults on these locations, right? Three phase and face to phase and uh, uh, single line to ground faults. And, and some other additional checks you would want to consider, you know, maybe to uh, uh, validate breaker failure logic at each end and, and also loss of potential, right? So what are some of the re common reasons why uh, end-to-end -end test would fail? Uh, would be, you know, like we discussed the timing delay between both uh, both ends, you know. Uh, the injection needs to be synchronized and we saw how you could find out the time delay if you're using two different test equipments for end-to-end -end testing. And sometimes you would not be having the RGB signal, like the signals would not be, uh, you know, re being received on the relays or on the test equipment. And sometimes you will not have a good reception of the GPS signals that's coming into the location where you are. Uh, and you you could have you know the incorrect test values being injected at one end uh, if you know there is not a good coordination when you're running the tests with the test cases that are being created and all that. Uh, here I have uh, shown some mega SMRT relay test products. Uh, one of them is the SMRT one. Like I've shown uh, it's a single phase test equipment. I've shown three of them it can be chained together to perform, you know, end-to-end uh, -end testing. Uh, here is a SMRT46, which is a three-phase uh, test equipment, and we have SMRT410D, uh, which is uh, more than uh, more currents and more voltage channels. We have a variety of these models, and uh, Megar also makes the MGTR2, which is the uh, GPS timing reference that. Uh, it acts as you know the timing uh, timing unit that receives the signals and, and give, provides you the accurate signals for the uh, test equipment. Right. Uh, so we are at the last slide, which is the conclusion. So today we discussed about uh, you know different types of protections that are implemented that are used. Uh, we did uh, go over the non-pilot scheme, which is the step distance, was one of the examples, and the pilot schemes. We went over many of them. And, and these are classified you know, under permissive and blocking. And we saw, we did do some comparison of the permissive and blocking type of schemes, um, uh, depending you know, on the factors of security of a scheme and dependability of a scheme. And then followed by that, we discussed uh, how to perform uh, or, or what kind of testing is done to validate the scheme, which is the end-to-end -end testing. And uh, we discussed uh, different challenges that can come that we could face. You know, like uh, we need to have accurate time signals, or uh, you know, the time delay between the two relay test equipments, and uh, communication issues. You know, between the relays, or the test value injection, the test cases are created correctly, and all those kind of things. Uh, finally, I would like to say, uh, you know, the knowledge of these protection schemes, uh, the different test methods, and the field experience will help. Uh, technicians perform the testing more efficiently. Uh, this uh, concludes uh, the presentation part. Now, uh, it's time for questions. All right, good deal. So as mentioned before, the presentation portion of our webinar is officially concluded. Uh, Sugosh, if you'd like, you can pause the recording on our questions slide for our audience here. Uh, so we'll take some time to answer as many of your questions as possible here shortly. If you have any questions, please submit them now into the Q&A box on the GoToWebinar control panel.
For those of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey should pop up on your screen. We would greatly appreciate if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so we can continue to improve upon future webinars. On the survey, there's a field where you can also request a demo or a quote on any mega products. A copy of this presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars, as well as register for upcoming webinars on our website at us.megar.com slash webinars and register for our next webinar on February 24th, titled Advantages and Limitations of VLF and TAN Delta Testing for Medium Voltage Cables. All right, let's get to your questions. Our first one is going to be directed to Danibal Mowing. Uh, Danibal, could you please define a mesh network? Uh, yes, Michael. Uh, thanks for the question. It's a good one to uh, know. Uh, see, before start the mesh network, uh, we have to understand why we are going for the mesh network. Like uh, we know, like we have a radial feeder network. Like uh, we start from the source side to source side to load side. The disadvantage that if we got any uh, disconnection in between the source and load, we lost the power to load. To avoid that, we go for the uh, uh, ring main system. In the ring main system, all the loads and the source uh, connected are interconnected. But the uh, disadvantage of ring main system, if one load side uh, have like both end uh, sending and receiving got open, so the specific load is out of power. So to avoid this uh, on the mesh network, what we do, it's a network topology. What we do exactly on the ring system, we connect all the uh, uh, source to the load side, possible way of connecting. So this will allow like even uh, load uh, load side get open at the both end of the uh, ring system. Still we get from another side, like it's like uh, interconnecting uh, in the rectangles, something uh, equal to that. So the ultimate goal of like a, a mesh network is like any possible condition we want to retain the supply to the load side. So it's like, uh, it's not one or two side feed. It is like possibly, preferably it's a three side uh, feeding for one load side. All right, thank you, Danibal. Sure. Our next question is gonna be over to Abel Gonzalez. Abel, can you list out the differences between these different distance characteristics? Um, hi guys. Well, I believe your uh, question has to do with the uh, differences between Mo and quadrilateral uh, characteristics, which are, I believe, the ones that uh, Sugosh showed on the on the slides, right? Now, uh, the Mo characteristic is, uh, I would say, one of the original characteristics used for distance protection. Um, it is the a natural derivation or a natural result of the uh, use of electromechanical uh, means of protection in uh, in power systems and uh, that's why it has that uh, round uh, the round form that comes from the uh, locus of the subtraction of impedances uh, as seen from the relay at the point of the uh, relay measurement right um, in the case of the now that that doesn't mean that the mole is only used with, uh, of course, um, electromechanical uh, relays, um, digital relays. The first thing that digital relays did was try to emulate uh, the electromechanical uh, character or the characteristics of electromechanical relays. And uh, for that reason, the uh, mole characteristic was, uh, you know, implemented immediately in uh, digital uh, relays. And uh, so that digital relays could replace existing Mo uh, relays without any type of, uh, you know, change in, in features and uh, without having to do um, a lot of uh, research into new characteristics. Now, quadrilaterals also existed um, with um, electromechanicals. And of course, it's not, not something that's completely new, but it was a little bit more difficult to develop because it needs uh, different elements to um, emulate the different um, sides of the quadrilateral that uh, we are talking about. 
and therefore they were um, more difficult to uh, implement and of course they were also implemented in the um, um, digital relays as soon as the digital relays became uh, uh, widely uh, available. Now the uh, differences when it comes to protection is that on the case of the MO characteristic you can basically play with the uh, diameter of the circle and you can have as many uh, zones as you as you want but it's basically always a uh, circular uh, form of course there are lenticular and other uh, forms that you know are i would say the derivations or uh, implementations of a <clears throat> circular type of characteristic but uh, we're talking about the the circular the perfect circular type of the mo uh, characteristic and the thing is that with the mo you can only play with the diameter of the of the circle in order to obtain the reach that uh, that you want and the other thing that you can play with is with the uh, MTA or the maximum torque angle another term that uh, is derived from the electromechanical uh, times which we have uh, continued to to use today but which has uh, no real um, meaning you know with the torque uh, part has no real meaning in the uh, digital digital work. Now the the thing is that you can not really change the mo characteristic itself unless you include uh, things that are uh, called uh, blinders in order to prevent things like load encroachment. So that's a little bit more difficult to deal with when you have a mo characteristic. With the quadrilaterals, on the other hand, you can define perfectly the uh, reach in each of the four or three sometimes quadrants in which you want the uh, um, protection to to operate. Another thing is that the mo characteristic as well as the uh, the quadrilateral are inherently uh, directional uh, characteristics and uh, the thing is that with the quadrilateral you can be more specific it's easier to obtain the the type of protection that you want, it's just a little bit harder to uh, figure out where do you want to put those uh, um, uh, the, the, the sites, I would say, of the of the quadrilateral in order to obtain the proper reach and the proper coverage of uh, the different areas of protection that uh, that we are talking about. Okay, uh, I guess I'm going to stop there. Uh, there is a webinar that we we did. We've done a couple of webinars on distance protection only, where these things are covered in uh, in great detail. All right. Thanks, Abel. Back over to Danibal. Uh, Danibal, what if the lines do not have the same length? How do you determine the zone margins? Additionally, what if there are one or more taps on line two? Yeah, it's a good one. Um, see, determining the zone margins or zone settings, uh, we have some specific guidelines uh, defined. Uh, say one, you've got only one transmission line, you may end up having only zone one or zone two. If you have the remote uh, substation, have multiple lines uh, with the various uh, length, uh, then it is a challenge for defining the zone one for the productive line, sorry, zone two and zone three for the productive line. So zone one, it is always like 70 to 95 percentage, but in general, we use 80 percentage of the productive line. And the zone two would be, the 120 percentage of the shortest line, what we are using in the uh, substation B, where it is originating from the substation B. Then the zone three would be like 150 percentage of the longest line, which is just originating from the substation B. That means like example, you have like a substation B, which you have like 20 miles line, 50 miles line and 100 miles line. So you will pick the uh, 20 percentage of like, uh, uh, 20 miles line for zone two of the uh, uh, substation A, and uh, zone three would be like 50 percentage plus zone one line length uh, for the zone three. Uh, I think that's it from my side on this one. All right then, uh, back over to Abel. Uh, Abel, will Z2 and Z3 act as backup protection for Z1 if Z1 protection fails to clear the fault? Um, yeah, okay. 
That's a, that's an interesting question. Um, and the answer is that, and I don't want to say that zone two and three will act as backup protection because even though Sugosh uh, showed zone three uh, in the forward direction, uh, it zone three could be in the forward direction, but you could also have a zone three in the backward direction. So um, that's why I don't want to say that zone two and three and I'm, what I'm going to say, uh, act as backup protection of zone one, what I'm going to say is that any forward-looking uh, zone will act as a backup of zone one. However, uh, when you have a fail of zone one operation, um, it is very likely that zone two will fail as well unless the zone one uh, I mean, the fault happened in the boundary be between the, the zones, and it was not. But if the, if the fault happened clearly on zone one, it's very likely that zone two won't see it as well. And the reason I say that is because it's very likely that the problem was with the relay and not with the uh, uh, fault detection algorithm. For that reason, I would say that even though they theoretically can act as a, as a backup, I mean, any forward-looking... Uh, a zone will act as a backup of the of the uh, previous um, zone, and the trip is going to be, of course, uh, slower. Um, it is good practice, and it is a practice that I have seen followed in um, a lot of uh, utilities and places to have a second relay looking in the same uh, direction, looking at the same line, uh, and it typically is a relay from a different uh, manufacturer. That and that's the relay that they use as a backup relay. They use the, these two relays to look at the same zone, so that it, it the, the same line. So that if one of the relays fails, then the second relay would uh, would operate. So the answer is um, uh, yes, no, and depends. And I recommend that a different hardware is, is used for for to use as backup. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, over to Danibal. If there is a conductor snapping between two substations, how can it be detected? If there are no line PTs at the receiving end, how can that be detected? This is really an interesting question, and uh, we will end up seeing these kind of scenarios where you have the industrial load that is a receiving end, and it may not have the source or may have the weekend source, actually. So it is really challenging to do uh, product this kind of lines it's so mainly depend on the one end uh, like uh, the substation which is the feeding end to detect zone one but we can also uh, trip the other end by using the uh, production function called we can in feed we can in feed is something like we can product the uh, open the circuit breaker which is source cannot which source cannot be bad feed the fault and uh, the the, the end feed the fault, it opens on the zone one or zone two, whatever it is sensing. But the other end cannot open because it cannot have a, uh, cannot detect the fault at the, the level or it, it is not able to like feed the fault. So then we can use the, we can in feed that is like combination of under voltage or kind of like sending the signal uh, to the remote end to open the, uh, uh, the remote end uh, breaker in case of like these scenarios. This is a really interesting one. Thank you. Thanks, Abel. Or sorry, Danibal's, you got Abel's name. Over to Danibal, or Abel, speaking of, what are the checks we can carry out whenever an auto recloser takes place? What are the checks to be carried out? And are the checks online or offline? Uh, Mike, thanks for, uh, you know, confusing me with Danibal. I wish I had his brains. Uh... Uh, I know, I had two <laughs> options. I messed it up four times. <laughs> So no, the the check. That's an. This is an interesting question. Um, it's kind of open. I'm going to you know answer as if I was being asked the question uh, from the perspective of a transmission line because that's what the uh, uh, webinar is about. And the reason I mentioned that is because we can have uh, auto reclosers operate on distribution line, and uh, the I would say. Uh, the answer would be a slightly different if we were talking about distribution uh, rather than uh, than transmission. And on the other hand, I am going to answer also uh, with the, uh, I would say, um, 
a boundary between uh, the, 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 the checks that the auto recloser does automatically when uh, doing the auto recloser, uh, the operation, and the checks that have to be performed by the personnel after the auto recloser uh, happened and the line went back into, uh, into operation. In the first case, um, auto reclosers are very are magnificent, you know, uh, machines. They perform uh, a lot of different uh, checks when they're doing the auto reclosure. They use, in some cases, and that's also part of the art of uh, power system protection, uh, because it's it's going to depend on uh, where uh, the philosophy of the of the line, the voltage levels, etc. But um, the, the checks uh, that are done by the auto reclosure machine are uh, is the line that I'm going to close to reclose on uh, life or is it dead? Uh, um, am I if it if it is alive? Do I have to check for do I check for synchronism, which I have to do if the if the line is alive? Uh, am I closing into a fault? All those things um, have to be performed automatically by the auto reclosure machine, and it's going to depend on the, uh, let's say, manufacturer and the philosophy that is followed on the utility that the auto reclosing is uh, configured on. However, once the auto recloser uh, happened, the personnel that, uh, you know, uh, the personnel that is uh, in charge of the transmission line that we are talking about, the, the, my suggestion would be go to the uh, 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 fault record or the oscillography Take, get to your um, um, uh, fault locator if you have one, go to your oscillography recorder if you have one, or just a relay that uh, perform the operation, open it and perform a, uh, a let's say, forensic analysis of the, uh, of the fault, see where the fault happened. And even though the auto reclosure was uh, successful, it uh, could have caused a type of damage that may allow the line to operate for a while uh, longer and the uh, auto reclosing and whatnot, but it may have caused the, the, the type of damage that could cause the, unit, the, the, the line to uh, fail uh, in a short time. So maybe a type of maintenance, you know, intervention uh, could be, uh, you know, recommended. So my, my, my take would be in the, in the second case, uh, get to the uh, oscillography and make an analysis of the oscillography, see if the auto reclosure happened uh, you know, properly and uh, for reasons that, and also check that uh, what was the actual fault level that was involved. The fault level was too high, then maybe you need to send somebody to you know, check the line. And for that, you know, what I'm saying is take the uh, fault locator uh, information that will tell you where the, the fault on the line is, and maybe you need to send. Sometimes you need to send a helicopter or something just to take a visual um, appraisal of the uh, of the of the fault. And if you think that the, there is no problem, leave it as it is. If not, a maintenance action can be in in order there. All right. All right. Thank you, Abel. Back over to Danibal, though. Uh, Danibal, could you please discuss open terminal keying or stop carrier when one end of the terminal is open in regards to breakers or line disconnection? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, this one is like a real practical scenario. It may happen or may not happen. Uh, assume like you got a, a, a fault in progress and you got open uh, one side of the breaker, line breaker is open, and uh, at the same time you got a carrier fail or it kind of like you got a carrier fail or it may be open it is called so carrier fail it is any point it is a carrier fail like other end is not receiving from the uh, one end of the breaker uh, which send a, a carrier <laughs> so it, it depends on the uh, depends on the schemes we used it, it, the production system is going to react in most of the cases it is going to operate on zone 1 and uh, zone 2 other end is uh, zone 1 and zone 2 it depends on the um, Operating time set on both sides, like uh, zone one and zone two of the other other end. But uh, uh, the special case is the DCUP scheme, like unblocking scheme. When the carry is lost, the unblocking the guard is gone, and uh, it will time out. And uh, uh, after the time out, it will go for the trip. That's the one uh, special condition there. Otherwise, uh, it's completely depends on the zone timing in this case, and uh, even some of the configurations the carrier fail is used to block the uh, the auto request scheme and other other trip transfer schemes actually uh, thanks 
Thank you. For our next question, I'm going to be throwing it over to our applications engineer, David Beard. Uh, David, what is the frequency of maintenance testing for relays as per IEEE and IEC? Uh, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> um, you know, we we get this question quite often, and we don't just necessarily get it for here. We almost get it for every webinar uh, that we do. And the, the answer still stays the same <laughs> for most of the time is, uh, you know, here we, we only talk about IEEE because uh, the webinar was created here. Uh, in the states. So as far as IEEE is concerned, we have some guidelines of how the test needs to be performed and how the production and the or production protection and the uh, philosophy of how to of how these elements work is listed in the IEEE guidelines. The things that are not listed uh, that I know of are the uh, intervals of testing. So usually the intervals of testing fall between uh, a couple different ways. Um, one would be uh, always check your relay manufacturing uh, documentation because they are the ones that created the relays, right? So they they uh, have developed these relays and they know what the what the relays are capable of. Then you have other entities uh, like here in the states. Um, you have NERC and and FERC and some other uh, you know WEC and different different areas. Uh, in the states that require testing intervals at different times, uh, and that's going to their guidelines. Um, depending on where you fall uh, within that in the states depends on your uh, intervals of how you're going to test. Now, also you have other um, uh, other testing um, maintenance uh, scheduled intervals, which come from NEDA or um, or just even the the um, utility itself uh, will have or a customer if you're a service company the customer would actually have um, their own testing requirements that they have fulfilled because what it, what it usually ends up happening is uh, for for governed uh, what am I trying to say so for governed uh, utilities and governed power systems uh, they have a defined line guidelines you know um, when you get to stations that are not uh, uh, governed by these entities, then uh, usually customers fall back on uh, NEDA specs or or some other type of testing guidelines that they've used for many years or a new maintenance plan that they have. So there's really not one um, solution to catch all. Um, what usually happens is you have to go up to your customer, or if it's you are the you are the end user of those relays, you need to determine how you want to test those provided by the guidelines uh, that your company is mandating. So, um, as a testing company, it's always a good idea to go. It's always a good rule of thumb, really, is to ask the customer, "Hey." What are you normally testing these by? You know, are you doing these in six months intervals? Are you doing these in, you know, uh, six month every six years? Are you doing these every couple years? What is your uh, uh, outline for how you want to perform that test? And then you follow those guidelines. Um, if they do not have a guideline, uh, what's really good uh, uh, as as you being a service company is to help them uh, help your customer perform some type of, you know create some type of maintenance program for them um, and that really helps too because the, because customers that don't have those programs put in place you can always mitigate that by giving them uh, some type of scheduled maintenance that, sh that your company is familiar with doing um, for other customers so there's always a lot of uh, a lot of explanation a lot of back and forth that happens with when should we test the relays when should we not when's the frequency of them but as um, as it's known here in the states, you know, microprocessor relays that are fully automated and can be monitored from a remote location um, usually get the the service and the testing intervals or maintenance intervals are actually longer than electromechanical relays. So with electromechanical relays, are more exposed to the to the elements and uh, could be outside in, in breakers catching, you know, whatever elements are out there in the weather um, and, and could could hurt the operation of them, whether it be faster or slower. So um, it, it's kind of a uh, conversation you need to have um, with uh, the customer or if you are, like I said, the end user, um, you know, come up with, with a plan and stick with that plan. Um, 
you know, maintenance maintenance doesn't get done uh, uh, every now and then. It's a schedule, and uh, it's just like operating on your vehicle. You know, you continuously change the oil in it for so many miles. It's it's a schedule that you perform. So um, I think here it's it's kind of uh, it's it's always a question, like I said, that we get asked. But also the answer uh, is is not going to be one answer for fits all. Um, I, I would just highly recommend talking to uh, your customer or or kind of searching some guidelines on uh, what you should do for your company. Thanks. All right, thanks, David. Uh, back over to Sugosh. Uh, Sugosh, one question: Would you be able to elaborate on which protection scheme is most commonly used? Uh, well, I mean, you know, it just depends on. Uh... Well, uh, which location you are in and, and all that, but most commonly that we have come across in uh, in the utilities in North America is the DCB scheme is very popular, um, and also you know, come across you know the POTT as well. But uh, going back to the DCB, that's uh, it's mostly used where you know the communications may be less secure during a, a fault on the line, right? So and it's also common because you know given the simplicity and the economics of implementing the scheme. At power line carrier, uh, you know, I would say DCP is the most commonly used ones that this I've seen. All right, thanks. Uh, so, Danibal, in what scenario will we use POTT and PUTT? Yeah, this is the interesting one. Uh, it's always with the setting guidelines guy will face this problem. So POTT, uh, most of the time, uh, it is used in the shortest short line. Say example, you got a switching substation, and from the switching substation, you got, a, a, say, 400 kV, and you got another substation you're feeding into two to 230 kV substation, or like it is a 400 kV to 230 kV substation. In this case, you don't have any back feeding from the, uh, the receiving substation, which is 400 to 230 kV, and your switching substation is 400 kV. This kind of scenarios, uh, it's a shortest line, and also you end up with having the short line. Then you will be going the best possible scenario to choose is POTT scheme. And you got a like example various switching substations. You got a long transmission lines like a, a thousand miles, hundred miles, five hundred miles. Those kind of uh, lines, it's 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 advisable to use POTT uh, to avoid a lot of other uh, uh, issues. As we have a wide range of uh, coverage since it is the longest line. Uh, permissive, it, permissive unreach will not, uh, un, the distance delays will not overreach in this case. Since it is the longest line, it have a quite margin to cover up properly. Thank you. Thanks, Tenable. Uh, back to Sugosh. Uh, what happens on a, a DCUB scheme if the communications are lost? Okay, so uh, you know we discussed uh, this on one of the slides. So when uh, you know when there is a communication failure or, or during a communication failure, uh, you know this unblocking feature in the scheme that provides a window, right? I explained about a timer, uh, and this window is typically around 100 to 150 milliseconds. And what happens is is that it lets the local relay uh, trip, right, unsupervised. So in that case, uh, the fault is still taken care of. But this has to be detected and trip uh, if you know the relays are going to trip within that window, and then, so that window is provided by DCUB scheme. All right. Uh, my next question, or is really a comment for David uh, in regards to NERC standards. David, would you like to field yeah. that? Yeah. So uh, I would like to uh, uh, just comment a little bit on this. So it came in just a few moments ago, and uh, it was uh, on testing intervals. NERC, and, the, and again, that we were. Uh, let me just rephrase the question we had before: was what is the frequency of the maintenance testing of relays as per IEC or IEEE? Now uh, the comment came in and said, you know, on the testing intervals, uh, NERC, which is the governing body here in the states standard PRC 005-6 establishes mandatory requirements for uh, protection system maintenance of the system associated with the BES, which would be the bulk electric system, subject to NERC standards. These standards are mandatory for companies and facilities registered with NERC, and that is a true statement. So that, that follows back into what uh, I was answering earlier was it depends on where you are. Like if you're, if you're, um, 
let's say you're a generation plant and you're part of the BES and you have NERC standards that provide these guidelines on when your testing intervals are, then you, you pretty much follow those. Um, now, let's say you are um, a, a small generation station or maybe you don't have generation and you do have, you're tied to transmission line, but the transmission line's under 100 kV. Let's say it's 69 kV. So are you bound by NERC standards to, to do those? No, because you fall under the guidelines for the NERC standards. So now, now we have to look at how do you want to perform the testing, right? So you are completely out of the boat of NERC. So you don't have to follow that guideline if you don't need to. And then now you're going to come up with your own maintenance plan. And that's where I was kind of coming back to um, uh, not only testing companies, but for companies that don't have that high level of transmission service. And what do we need to follow to do the guidelines? Uh, or what do we what maintenance standards do we need to follow to provide testing? And I think that's where it comes into. We need to have conversations. We need to talk between the utility, uh, uh, that company and the testing company and say, look, what are you normally seeing? You know, what what are some of the, the failure rates or, or the calibration mismatches that we have from the days these were in service to now? And let's provide some type of scheduling document. Let's, let's set it up, you know, because setting up these maintenance intervals, whether it be mandated or not, are good for the equipment because then it allows you to exercise that equipment as well. And uh, if you guys, uh, you know, if everybody's kind of looking at the states a little bit, you know, we got quite a few power outages. We have quite a few things that are happening here and uh, not to go off complete topic, but maintenance is important. And uh, as you can see, sweeping the U.S., maintenance is a big concern. And uh, was it maintenance properly? If it is, it's working. If it's not, then we're kind of in limbo. So just kind of gives you an idea of a, little, of a little bit of what's happening. But two, uh, I did want to bring this comment to light um, because we are talking about a specific standard in here, but that specific standard doesn't apply to everybody, um, especially if you're uh, following the IEC guidelines, which are actually international. Um, which they don't follow by NERC standards. So now we need to figure out what what is that maintenance interval going to look like. So we we kind of play to the world a little bit. So we don't always uh, have our answers for the U.S. We try to you know make sure that we're covering a wide range of of U.S. and international. So that that is a comments I'd like to just follow up on a little bit. Um, so thank you, Mike. Of course, and thank you, David and Sugosh and Danabal and Abel. It looks like we're coming out of, well, we've run out of time for our Q&A session today. Uh, I'm sorry if we didn't get your question live, but we work, we will work to follow up with you offline. But as a reminder, uh, a copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to everyone in about two business days. Uh, but I'd like to thank you all for attending. If you could, please remember to answer our survey. That survey will include a field for you to request a quote or a demo if you're interested. But once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and I hope you all have a great weekend.